Amen. Amen. Good morning. And uh, we are going to continue in our series on memorial stones. I'm telling the, the story of our church and our fellowship, and we're learning lessons along the way. Uh, I'm actually just going to dispense with the scripture. We, we're going to end a little bit early because we have a wedding uh, today. So I'll get right into it. We are now uh, up to 1973, and today we're going to talk about church planting. And so where we left it last week, my father, Wayman Mitchell, had become convinced that God's will was discipleship. The way to train workers uh, for pastoral ministry was not through Bible school. It was through pastoral ministry. He had been working with some men. And last week, our first, what was supposed to be our first church planting venture in Kearney, Arizona... Uh, wasn't going to work out. The, the people that originally wanted a pastor decided when they saw uh, Harold Warner street preaching in the parade, that wasn't what they wanted. And so he was on his way back. And uh, while it was raining, the car slid off the road, uh, slid off the highway, rolled, and Harold's back was broken. He was paralyzed. That's where we left it. Last week, he was in the hospital. And uh, this caused a... A, a stir in the church and some people were using that trying to say that this was a sign from God. God doesn't want us to plan uh, to plant churches and so that is where we left it. Kind of felt last week like an old episode of Batman. You know, can they survive? Can church planting survive? So we had to stay tuned to the same Memorial Tunes, uh, Stones channel here. Okay, church planting. There's a lesson that I want to give you right now, and that is God works out his will. And we've been interweaving in all of these lessons, not a plan of man, a plan of God. So now we have something. The vision has been revealed in its, in its uh, embryonic uh, stages or, or form of church planting and the first time we try it, it doesn't work out. In fact, there's a tragedy. So there's a, a great lesson. On the way, some people, as I said, they took that. If something bad happens, it's either the judgment of God or that's God's way of saying, I don't want you to plant churches. But in fact... Anytime we try to do God's will, there will be reversals. There will be problems that, that uh, doing right doesn't exempt us from that. But here's the lesson. If it is God's plan, God is going to work out his will in spite of it. There may have been people in the church who were, this can't be. God knew what he was doing problems don't stop or deter him from his will. I want to put a slide up on the screen. Remember I told you in the early part of uh, ministry, you're putting it up, the lesson of God, no, they missed it. Stephen, you got to help me here. There was, uh, I told you that uh, a man named Dick Mills, that he gave, uh, accurate words, and one of the things he gave was uh, scriptures. I was going to put on the screen, it was supposed to be on the screen, was a, uh, a word that he gave my father in 1967. And uh, in 1967, he gave, I've already showed you Isaiah 58, 12. And um, in Isaiah 58, 12, it has to do with uh, rebuilding the waste places. There it is, Okay. So here is a word that he gave my father. Look at this. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. And you understand the word perfect. This is not perfect or sinless. It is complete. The Lord will complete that which concerns me. So that is something in early days, I'm sure my, my dad getting this, he made some notes there. My dad's chicken scratch. I'm not even... I was the only interpreter, and I can't even read that word. I don't know what it says there. But, but God looking in the future, this is a word for my father. Even if there's problems, 
God is still going to complete it. So church planting, Harold in the hospital, the first venture is now derailed, but God completes what he starts. And that is, that is true uh, always. That was true for Harold Warner. Harold Warner was uh, in the hospital in Phoenix. Uh, I don't remember if that was Good Samaritan uh, Hospital or, or St. Joe's, but uh, they began to prepare Harold for a great adjustment, life in a wheelchair. The, the news they gave, you will never walk again. And so as part of that adjustment, they started teaching Harold Warner leather craft. Basically, you're not going to be able to work a job. You're, you know, you're just going to be able to sit around making belts. That's going to be your future. But Harold was having none of it. No, he was called by God. And if he was called by God, that means God is going to complete that which concerns me in the hospital, Harold never changed. He was a witness everywhere he went. Numbers of people here won to the Lord by Harold Warner. In the hospital, he is witnessing, telling people about Jesus. He started a Christian radio program broadcasting in the hospital because he was called to preach. And that is, uh, that is a, a promise of God. God doesn't give up when there's a problem. This is especially true in church planting. Because there was a problem, because it appeared to be stopped, but God has not stopped. God works out his will. So while Harold is in the hospital, my father then turned to what was originally supposed to be the second couple sent out, but instead now they became the first. Ron and Susie Burrow were sent to Wickenburg, Arizona. There's a picture now of uh, Ron and Susie. And uh, Wickenburg, Arizona, uh, probably when my dad in 1960, population 3,000, it might have gained uh, four chickens and six people since then. A very, very small town. Uh, next picture here is Susie uh, in the desert. And the important thing was Ron Burrow had never gone to Bible school. He had gotten saved. 1970, he was a hippie using drugs, he gets saved, now trained in-house. And I, I want, this is totally normal. In two weeks, we'll have a conference. It'll be like, yeah, yeah, Thursday night, there'll be international, Friday night. You have to understand how revolutionary this was for people. We are sending a man to pastor who has never been trained in school uh, uh, to pastor. Ron and Susie, they rented a small uh, building. It was actually the old Texas bar. They removed the bar. Uh, hopefully people are not going to be needing that. They put down a little bit of carpet. They had some old chairs. And it could seat 38 people. And as part of this, they're going to have a grand opening. We sent an impact team. By, back then they used to call them guerrilla teams is we sent people to witness. This is going to be the establishing of the church. And Ron and Susie showed Thief in the Night. How many of you remember Thief in the Night? One of the original evangelistic uh, movies uh, ever. And he showed that in the Wickenburg Community Center and 200 people came out. That's a significant part of the population 17 people got saved, and more impressive than 17 people getting saved, the next morning they all came to church. And he began to build from that. I have a few uh, other pictures here. This is now uh, here in the building <clears throat> there. And one more uh, picture. This is now in the building plain, but they are, they are building a work for God. So Ron began to do exactly what his pastor taught him to do in Prescott. Began to witness, began to do outreach. He adapted some things, then that's wise. Uh, he was from a rock and roll band in Wickenburg. That was not the draw, so he said that was the first time that he learned any country songs. 
and began to play some country music. But the principle was exactly the same. That's wise. You are simply adapting what draws. Remember what we said an outreach is? An outreach is either find a crowd that already exists or create a crowd. And that's what he saw in Prescott. That is what he learned. That is what he repeated. And uh, so he began to do this, began to establish concert ministry and did that. So seating 38 people, they quickly outgrew the building. And so the buildings were not in plentiful supply in Wickenburg in those days. And so they had to, to make a plan. And so my father took an offering. We are going to build a building in Wickenburg. And now fundraising like this is easy because it's connected to vision. People had seen. They know Ron and Susie. This is not a face that they don't know in a faraway place. These are one of our own. This is part of our church family, our doing a work for God. They had gone on impact teams. They were seeing some of these people got saved. And so my father took an offering to build a building. They found a small piece of land. Here's a lesson. This is foundational. This was the very first time that it happened. But the lesson that we use to this day is you support what you plant. That is a powerful thing that has to happen. You have to support what you plant. We do not have couples and say, God bless you, let us know how it goes. If we are sending them, we fund them, and we are uh, uh, going to stand behind them. Ron's uncle was in the church. He was a contractor. And uh, uh, he was actually the one that built the Ruth Street building. And so we bought all of the supplies. He got a large crew of men. And on the lot there, they built a 40 by 60 building in two days. They banged it out. By the next Sunday, they had church in the new building. I'm suspecting they were not dealing with Prescott Valley Planning and Zoning. There, right there. <laughs> Building, <laughs> the building department apparently was a little different than what we're used to around here. But they did this. They had church in the building by the next Sunday. And I want you to understand how incredible this was. Again, never went to Bible school, but it worked. The same gospel that worked in Prescott worked in Wickenburg. The same strategy of outreach it worked in Prescott. It worked in Wickenburg. People kept getting saved. A congregation was built. And in seven months, that church became fully self-supporting. So this was incredible. We're off and running. But the lesson here was, this wasn't a Prescott thing. This was a God thing. So this wasn't just something that, wow, that's what's happening in Prescott. My father saw this is reproducible. Everything God is doing here, he can do in another place. So Wickenburg, Arizona, therefore, was our first actual church plant ever in the fellowship uh, history. That was in 1973. That was 50 years ago now. And so, again, the, the, just the ground shake the earth shaking importance of that was my father saw men could preach they could be trained and developed they could do a work for God without going to Bible school our second church was in Flagstaff Arizona and again you I want you to understand this most of the churches when we're starting were nearby Flagstaff Arizona just got a picture of the town uh, I don't have any photos of the church or the, the building back then. I, I keep telling guys, this is one of the things. We were living history. We didn't realize it. And people were not writing things down and saving photos thinking someday Pastor Gray's going to need this, right? <laughs> so, but this is Flagstaff. This is a, a, an old uh, uh, picture there. Now, the first church was a complete pioneer from scratch. But we were a part, my father was a part of the Foursquare Gospel Church. 
So he was loyal to the, the denomination and uh, wanted to be a blessing uh, to them. So he began to tell the supervisors. We'll talk about this. I'll, I'll expand on this later on. But denomination means centralized control. All staffing of churches came from central places. It wasn't decided by churches themselves or by uh, uh, pastors. It was decided. So my dad began to let the powers that be know. He began excitedly telling them, we sent this guy, young guy, he got saved, we trained him, and he's building a work for God. So he said, if you have any churches, we have men that we can put into those churches because, and I'll explain that in greater detail, that's a big problem with centralized control as you wind up having little churches or broken churches that it's pretty hard to fill. Flagstaff, Arizona was our, our second one. They said, yes, we have a man that is going to retire and uh, there is a, a congregation, there's 10 people, but there's a building and uh, you, if you have a man, you can send a worker there. We sent the second uh, couple, Ronna Marie Jones went there, started with 10 people, building on the principles he learned in Prescott, and the church began to grow. They stayed there several years, built the church up to about 40 people or so. Moving on then, Harold and Mona Warner. Harold, eventually after they... Uh, got him to a place where he can function in a wheelchair. Harold got out of the hospital, and we have a picture uh, of here. This is him in the wheelchair with the family. Mona is his wife in the top left corner. That is uh, Mona's mother, Tony Pena, part of our church, a blessing to us for many years. And that is her sister, Veronica, and Dink Zeiss. So he gets out of the hospital, and so now because he's in a wheelchair, my dad offered to him, would you like to stay in Prescott? You can uh, assist me here in the church. But Harold said, no, I'm called to preach. Called to preach walking, called to preach in a wheelchair, it doesn't matter, I am called to preach. And he didn't move away from that calling. That, that's, that speaks well of him. He didn't change his mind about the will of God based on circumstances. He said, I am called to preach. He was chomping at the bit, ready to go. And uh, so again, in speaking to uh, those in charge in the denomination, they said a small church is open in Tucson, Arizona. It actually was the mission church for the main church, I told you years ago how Chuck Smith uh, was the pastor in like 1960 something, early 60s. When he left, he went to take the main church because he could make more money. That's according to his biography. They had a little mission church. And the mission church, that of course, in their minds, that's for down and outers, probably uh, people of other races. That would be what a mission church was to them. But they were willing to let untrained men have churches. Again, they weren't offering nice churches, right? Um, we're we're going to show you a, a, a picture in a minute, not now, but uh, this building, they said that the, the roof, and you'll be able to see it in the picture, it looked, looked, like, uh, it looked like waves uh, going on. But here, 2 Samuel 5, 8, here's a Bible principle when David is training his men. And is someone going to read that? Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of water, shaft, and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore, they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Okay, here's a Bible principle, is sometimes when you get an opportunity, it doesn't come in a beautiful form. So they wanted to attack the city and David said, there is a way in. They have walls and gates. We can't get in that way, but there's a water shaft. So at the least, the water shaft would have been difficult to climb up in very narrow, especially if you're claustrophobic. 
uh, very possibly be slimy. Some scholars say it's possible that this was also used as um, the uh, sewer uh, route. So it'd be messy and stinky. But my point was, there was a man that said, I'll do it. And he went, I will, because it's an opportunity, I feel that's what God wants us to do. So he went for it. That was Harold. This is not a nice building. This is not a fantastic opportunity. But they were thrilled to death in December of 1973. Harold and Mona went and took the church. We have a picture of the original building. You see the roof there. Here is Harold. It was very tiny. Look how close the people were to him. But in a wheelchair, preaching the gospel, exactly the same. Next picture here. Uh, here's Harold and Mona in uh, front of, I don't know if that's the first or the second building there, but they began to uh, preach. Right away, people started getting saved. Next picture, you may recognize this guy. Here is Paul Campo, now one of the leaders of our fellowship. He had gotten saved, and now he is baptizing. And so it began to work exactly the same. The church started growing as Harold Warner repeated what he had been taught. That is what discipleship is. You learn, you catch your pastor's spirit, you learn certain principles of how to do the, the, the work for God, but at the end of the day, discipleship is a man is going to do what his pastor would do if he was there. And that is exactly what Harold Warner did is the strategy of evangelism, witnessing. He witnessed personally. They did outreach. They began to repeat it. We have a picture of an early outreach. Here's Harold in a wheelchair on outreach. Check out all the bell bottoms. This, is, this tells you the era that we were in. But here in Tucson, people started getting saved. And Harold began making disciples. His, his spirit, his passion... As young men came in, it wasn't just come to Jesus and sit in a pew. It was God has a plan for your life and began to inspire them with the same vision that he had been uh, taught. So now this is church number three and we learned something important. Clearly this was, you know, you could have one church and it was a fluke. Um, who knows why that worked? Second one works. Now we're on the third one. Two out of the three never went to Bible school. And, and, and I, again, I, you don't, maybe you can't grasp because this seems like, of course, that's what we do. But in those days, people did not become pastors without going to Bible school. And so now it was not a Prescott thing. It was not a Flagstaff thing, a Wickenburg thing. A two, it's going to work. It is transferable because this is God's vision. It will work anywhere. And that is what my father began to be more and more convinced of. Let's move on. Let's talk about the lesson. The next lesson is the unfolding of God's will. If you had been here any amount of time, my father would often make a statement. People would ask about the early days and he would make this statement. He said, we stumbled into the will of God. That, that is very, very an interesting statement. What my dad was saying, people had the idea that somehow he was at home and an angel appeared and said, write this down. And he had this vision. It would be in crystal clarity and perfect detail and then it's going to be flat and then it's going to be it wasn't like that he didn't have the master plan in great detail he wanted to do God's will and remember let's go back let's put up a scripture again that uh, this is foundational again Dick Mills said this scripture your ministry is going to follow these lines. And he said, those that come from you, they shall be of thee. This is King James. They that come from you will build up the old waste places. And you will raise up the foundations 
of many generations, you'll be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to, to dwell in. That was in the same meeting where he got the other word, 1967, this man by a gift of the Spirit said, that'll be the mark of your ministry. So now my dad simply wants to get people saved and the will of God unfolded. He began responding to opportunities, responding to circumstances. And he said he believed that the foundations that that scripture was talking about for his life had to do with evangelism. My father did not in invent evangelism. He didn't invent having outreaches. He didn't invent witnessing. Those were old paths that many churches had moved away from. Discipleship. The whole idea that you can train a man for ministry without him going to college or university, that wasn't my dad's plan. That was Jesus' plan. But now he is restoring it. The church, by and large, had moved away from discipleship. They, the only path in those days to become a pastor was going to school, and especially my father saw what God was doing was restoring the local church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, my father said that scripture there is absolutely the foundation of our church. Right there. That scripture says... The church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the fullness of God's plan. Everything God does is going to come through the church. But my point is, those were unfolded over time. He got hippies saved, they began to witness. Then he began to hear about people doing concerts, outreach. If you want to do God's will, and if you'll keep your heart right, God will show you the way. But many times it will unfold gradually. It will not be in perfect detail for all the years to come. Look at Proverbs 4, 18, and this is in the New Century Version. The way of the good person is like the light of dawn, growing brighter and brighter until the full daylight. Okay, the way you understand this this uh, word as used here is the path. The road you travel on in life is like the dawn. I was up this morning just before four in the morning and I saw this, the light gradually. It, it wasn't, isn't it good that the, that the sun does, doesn't come on? <laughs> it's gradual. But the Bible says that is how. My father didn't understand the master plan. He wanted to do God's will. Anybody who wants to do God's will, God can guide you. There are people you're worried, I don't know what's God's plan for it. If you want to do God's will, he will unfold it gradually. He unfolds something, he shows you something, and you say, okay, I will obey, and then God shows you more. My father said over and over again, he said we stumbled into the will of God, and that's what he meant. It wasn't in crystal clarity. It unfolded over time. Next lesson has to do with this, and I, I remind you again, God is in control of his work. My father believed that this was a heavenly vision. God had revealed the idea of the local church, discipleship, church planting. He felt that was a vision from God. But at the end of the day, God is in control. So what that means is that God has the right, he has the power to direct our plans. He actually has the right sometimes to override our plans. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Okay, God is not against planning, but this scripture says sometimes in life you plan on the best available information you have, 
this is what I'm going to do, but the Lord directs your steps. So that direction may come in the form of changing what you planned. As soon as my dad began to get any kind of vision and, and the hope of church planting, he was always scouting for new places to plant churches. I remember as a boy vacationing in Nogales, Arizona. We actually have the a photo of where we vacation, the Time Motel, baby, Nogales, Arizona. I know there'll be people from Nogales. I don't mean to offend you, but we did not go there for the beauty, okay? It was hot. We we're going there in the summertime. We went there because my dad was always looking, where could we plant churches? And that's why we went. He saw Nogales, Arizona, and he said, I believe we could plant a church in Nogales. For those, uh, there will be people that are not from around here. You'll be watching online. I, I, I want to show you Nogales. Uh, next one. Nogales is unique. It is a border town. It is split in half. There is no gap. There's a fence in the middle. Uh, doesn't work very well, but it, it's there. And that is literally there is Nogales, Arizona. You step through the fence and you are in Nogales, Mexico. Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. I remember we went uh, as part of the vacation uh, one day. And, you know, personally, we didn't we didn't have any idea that that wasn't the vacation spot to us. It had a pool and it had a TV, we thought this was heaven. So <laughs> it was great. So uh, I remember one, one day on our vacation, we crossed the border. And uh, you know, some of you that's just like, yeah, no big deal. That, that was like, oh, we're like in another country. I remember it because my sisters, I was the youngest, I had four sisters and uh, they could, uh, they were larger and they had numbers. I bought a bullwhip in Mexico, and I evened things up, but uh, that's a story for another day. My dad, no doubt, as we crossed the border, we went and bought, you know, Mexican tourist stuff, and no doubt he was dreaming of someday planting a church, but he had no idea how would you go about reaching another nation. But remember what I said, God's in control. So God, sometimes he directs, he can direct by a voice, he can direct by the word of God, he can direct by gifts of the spirit. Sometimes God directs us by arranging circumstances. So several things happen to guide us. Number one is a Mexican man named Cruz Guerrero came here illegally and came to Prescott, Arizona. In those days... Prescott, Arizona was not a great place to hide from the authorities. You didn't, you didn't blend in well here. Prescott was white, white, white. But he got saved in the concert uh, uh, ministry, but it's clear it's not going to be possible in those days at least for him to stay. My dad, having scouted Nogales, Arizona, he decided to plant a church there and uh, that is uh, what we decided to do. We planted the fourth church, got a picture here, Nogales, Arizona. This, of course, is a very uh, old picture of it. Now, we had no manual, and, and I'll, I'll expand on this in a later lesson. There was no church planting manual. How do you plant churches? There was no guide, church planting for dummies. There was no YouTube videos on church planting. There was nothing. So all he knows is the Bible says, train them through discipleship and launch them out, but he didn't know. So now he sent a couple from our church, Jack and Patty Harris, and he also sent two other couples that move with them, not to pastor, but to help. Okay, we don't, we don't have any manual. This is, seemed like a, a, a great idea. Uh, George and Iris Shields and uh, Bob and Cher Porter moved as well to Nogales, Arizona to help establish this. Cruz Guerrero is not going to be able to stay in Prescott, so they took Cruz back, and the idea, what their idea was, 
we'll sneak him back across. We'll, we'll get a gringo coyote to get him across. Once he's across, we'll help him get papers. And when he gets his papers, we'll now legally get him back in America so he can help us build the church in Nogales, Arizona. Nogales being predominantly Hispanic. So that was the human plan. Now, in those days, there were not many buildings to rent. Okay, Nogales didn't have an abundance of buildings that we could uh, possibly rent. So my dad found a church building that was for sale. There was a guy, I don't know if he was going to retire or he was going to do something else. But he offered to sell his church building. And so, again, raising an offering, we put $5,000 down to buy it. Now, here is where God gets involved in the whole process. My father was very smart. He was a very, he had a very sharp business mind. He drilled into me. You pay attention to the contracts. And in this, he missed a clause when we bought the building. And the clause that he didn't see was, after the building is sold, the man who sold it to us, if he wanted to, he could stay for six more months rent-free. So the Harrises, the Shields, and the Porters, they moved down there, and guess what? The man says, I'm not moving. I'm staying for another six months. But they've uprooted their whole lives to build a church. There aren't other building options. So what are we going to do? Twiddle our thumbs for six months. And so meanwhile, across the border, while trying to get papers for crews, crews started witnessing and people started getting saved. The gospel worked in Mexico just liked it, like it worked in America. And so Jack Harris said to Pastor Mitchell, while we're waiting... He's got some people saved. Why don't we try? What do you think about just trying to build a, you know, let's start with a Bible study. Maybe we could build a church in Mexico while we're waiting for the building in Arizona. And that is exactly what happened. So we planned Arizona. God planned Mexico. Because we, don't, we wouldn't have known how God forced our hand into opening a church in Mexico. So the, the church began to grow. People started getting saved. Good things started happening. And it looked almost like an accident. Again, what did my father say? We stumbled into the will of God. It wasn't an angel saying, Wayman, Mexico, yes, Lord. No, circumstance like, man, I can't believe we didn't catch that clause. Let's not waste time. So they started building a church in uh, Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. They finally then, after six months of this, they were finally able to open the church on the Arizona side. We have a uh, picture here in the Arizona side. They were able to uh, open this. So for a time, this man actually had two churches going at the same time. They had the church in Nogales, Mexico, the church in Nogales, Arizona, and they were doing that. Next picture here is on the Arizona side. This is Nogales, Arizona. This is an early uh, a concert flyer and uh, invitation. They... Uh, the man got word that Nikki Cruz was coming to Nogales, Arizona. How many of you know who Nikki Cruz is? Cross and Switchblade. He was the original gang member that got saved under David Wilkerson's ministry. He was coming and he was going to do a citywide crusade. So what this meant was that all the churches who wanted to were going to band together. They're going to rent a building. They're going to advertise and Nikki Cruz is going to preach. Nikki Cruz was uh, uh, saved in the Assembly of God. He was a Pentecostal. And uh, so this is what happened. 
All the churches are banding together, and what they did is they assigned people your gift. What is, what is your gift to the crusade going to be? And so they assigned our church, you are going to pay for all the advertising. And so uh, Nikki Cruz uh, uh, came. Numbers of people got saved. He prayed for the Holy Spirit. Numbers of them got filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, wound up uh, getting baptized. Uh, he used common sense. I don't know if he got this from uh, my father in, in talking to him, but he saw what was going to happen is that we were going to pay for the advertising. We were going to do a good portion of the work because our church believed in evangelism and they were going to take the converts. And so what he did each night in the crusade is he announced when the crusade finishes Saturday, Sunday, we're going to be showing some films. And in those days, <laughs> TV, very limited, right? Films. Remember in the day you could show a movie and, and a lot of people would come. So they're announcing this. So the bulk of the fruit from the crusade wound up coming to church. There are people in the church today that got saved in the Nikki Cruz crusade. Thank God. And that is how our church in Arizona really got a boost in, and uh, uh, began to go on. At the same time, here is, this is now Nogales, Mexico, began to do uh, healing crusades, and I'll, I'll tell the story of healing crusades in Mexico in a, in a later one. But here, I want you to understand this, Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, was our first international church. And, and so you have to grasp how absolutely revolutionary this was. The man who pioneered these churches did not go to Bible school. That's number one. But now number two, this was incredible. What God was doing was not just a Prescott thing. In fact, it wasn't even an American thing. This was a God thing. And if it is a God thing, it will work anywhere in the world. Think about the impact now from those seemingly accidental beginnings. I want you to show, this is now, you can go at any time to cfmmaps.org and it will show all the churches in the world if you're wanting to look for an address. This is Mexico, and uh, you can't see clearly, but many of those where it says we have a church, you know, uh, up there, there's one that says uh, 35 churches, 22 churches. Right now, as of June 2023, we now have 436 churches in Mexico. Think about that. 436 other churches, of course, planted. We're not the only ones that planted there. But many of these churches came originally from that church in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, that looked by an, uh, like an accident. But God wanted there to be churches in Mexico. Not only are there 436 churches in Mexico, from Mexico... They have now, as of June 2023, they have planted churches themselves in 16 other nations of the world. So this is the, the work of God that we're a part of. It is supernatural. And this is what God does, is people who keep their hearts right. That's the crucial thing. You, you have to survive over time. You can't become twisted or embittered over people, over circumstances. You have to want the will of God. And when you want the will of God and you keep your heart right, you will discover that God guides you. And this is true. This is where church planting first began, is initially we just started was, here are churches that are close. They were experiments. Dad had the vision, didn't know how it would work because there was no template. There was no book. We didn't know. But we risked and we tried and wound up seeing look what God has done. That is why my father would say always 
he said, this is a work of God, not of man. Because he didn't plan it. Some people think, wow, Pastor Richard, he was so smart, he planned it. But that's not what he said. He said, this is a work of God, not of man. And I stumbled into the will of God. So the lesson for us then, as we go forward in your life, do you want the will of God? If you want God to guide you, you, gotta, you have to want God's will. God doesn't guide people who don't want his will. And secondly, will you keep your heart right? In all of the changes, we've been doing this now, planting churches for 50 years, and we see the hand of God again and again because this is a work of God. Isn't that wonderful? Let's give God praise for that right now. We thank God for his goodness. Thank you, Jesus, God, that you allow us to be a part of it. Thank God. We'll move on uh, next week. Then we'll move on uh, expanding the story of church planting and how we begin to spread across America and, uh, into other nations. We're going to look at that. We're going to stop a little earlier here. We have the wedding coming up. And uh, so uh, let's do that. To, uh, someone sent me a text here. Wickenburg was 1973. That's when it started. Church planting started 50 years ago. Those three churches that I just said were all, uh, actually three of the four were all 1973. Mexico was 1974. Amen. God bless you. We're going to start this service at 1030.